In a mana in a reo e rora katima tirama tena kota kaktoa. Ko wai ho, ko Helen Nicholson toko ingwa, te po koko matoraka te fare wangana o taco. Norera tena koto, tena koto, tena kota katoa. Kia ora, my name's Helen Nicholson. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, and it's um, my pleasure to welcome you all to this special occasion to celebrate the promotion of Yolanda van Hiesik to Professor. And I'm delighted that we can once again meet and have these inaugural professorial lectures. Um, sadly, COVID has interfered with very many of the things that we hold dear. So these lectures are a great opportunity for us to take time out of our busy t lives and to listen to our amazing staff and to broaden our understanding of what goes on in our university. So I'd like to welcome many colleagues from across the university, as well as students and friends, but I'd like to give a very special welcome to Yolanda's friends and family who've joined us this evening. Promotion to professor is not something that's easily achieved at Otago. And in order for Yolanda to have been promoted, she's gone through a rigorous process where she's had to demonstrate she has achieved sustained outstanding leadership in research, teaching and service. Professor Barker is going to formally introduce Yolanda in a moment, but I just want to say a few words to set the scene. Yolanda's been at the university in the Department of Zoology since 2001. And despite working part-time, she's maintained a substantial teaching role and played a key role in the development and success of the Wildlife Management Programme. In research, Yolanda is widely recognised as an expert in urban ecology, invasive species, and human-wildlife, human-nature relationships. In fact, her referees talk about her being the most widely known New Zealand conservation scientist in the US. And she has made significant impact beyond traditional publication modes. Her work has influenced policy development by the Department of Conservation and the Dunedin City Council. Most notably, Yonanda is a leader in a wide range of diversity projects biodiversity projects that are making a difference on the ground to the reversal of biodiversity decline of New Zealand's indigenous flora and fauna. So Yolanda's research is truly interdisciplinary and she has covered a whole well, range of biological aspects of biodiversity conservation and she's had a notable impact both in academia and the wider community. We're very fortunate, Yolanda, to have you as part of our university. Congratulations on your promotion, and I'm really looking forward to your lecture. So I'll hand over now to Richard Barker. Tēnā koutou koutou. Professor Nicholson, tēnā koe. Professor Blakey, tēnā koe. Professor Van Hesek, tēnā koe. Associate Professor Lockman, tēnā koe. Friends and colleagues, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Yolanda Van Hesek, to give her inaugural professorial lecture here at the University of Otago. As indicated by Professor Nicholson, Yolanda is one of our more recent additions to the professorial ranks here at the University of Otago, having received a well-deserved promotion to the position in February 2019. COVID has kept us waiting for this important celebration. I'm going to have to wait for the pepeha to find out where Yolanda was born, but I do know that she attended Queen's High School here in Dunedin. At the time, the prestigious subjects at Queen's were in languages and the classics, and in order to study science, she had to head across to the neighbouring King's High School for her classes, with one exception, which was biology, which was taught at Queen's, supported by what Yolanda says were re fantastic resource kits provided by the University of Otago. Yolanda refers to her tastes in animals, and I'm speaking metaphorically, as being very Catholic. 
This is reflected in her publication record, which covers various aspects of the biology of 23 different bird species, including six different penguin species, eight mammals, three invertebrates, lizards, and even one tortoise. After completing high school, the University of Otago beckoned, and it was here that she graduated first with her honours degree and then with her PhD. I just found out that her first PhD supervisor was um, Kai Westerskopf, uh, but he left after a year into Yolanda's PhD and was taken over uh, by Lloyd Davis. And I'm looking to see if I can spot Lloyd in the audience. I know Lloyd's around, but not here today. Okay. Needless to say, this was on penguins, and also needless to say, it included field work in Antarctica. Her topic was the study of penguin diet and the requisite samples were obtained by inducing the penguins to vomit and then sifting through the material that to, produce, uh, to look for the diagnostic remains. Yolanda tells us that health and safety rules at the time weren't quite what they are today and she would sift and sort her vomit samples in the same office as her fellow PhD students. She reports that at least one of the students was not put off by this, that was one Phil Seddon. Got a fill. After completing her PhD, Professor Van Hesek took on, took on a postdoctoral fellowship also on penguins at the Percy Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. From there, her work took her to Saudi Arabia, where she worked from 1991 until 2000 as a wildlife biologist at the National Wildlife Research Centre. I will let Yolanda relate anecdotes from her time there, but based on the briefing that she gave me, um, this was quite interesting. In 2001, to our good fortune, uh, Yolanda joined the University of Otago on a 0.4 FTE appointment to co-lead our world-renowned wildlife management program. Despite being on continuing fractional appointments since that time, she has been an incredibly productive researcher which has been recognised with this promotion to Professor. Professor Van Hesek has published 131 peer-reviewed journal articles, two books and 13 book chapters. She has received significant grant funding for her work, including a full Marsden as co-PI in 2013 titled Natural Neighbourhoods for City Children and also as a team leader on two MBIE Endeavour grants, all advancing her interest in Indigenous nature and urban environments. Great research will not get you promoted to professor at the University of Otago on its own. You have to be an all-rounder, all and Yolanda is also an outstanding teacher. She has been leading the wildlife management program at Otago since 2001, an outstanding postgraduate program that is sought after by prospective students from around the world. Her evaluations by students are excellent, and she has also supervised 10 PhDs and 10, 40 masters to completion all while on a fractional appointment. Service to the university and wider community is another area in which Professor Van Hesek excels. For the university, this includes service on our Animal Ethics Committee for more than a decade now, and as an observer on academic promotion committees. Her expertise on penguin ecology has led to her invitation to membership of the IUCN Specialist Group, Penguin Specialist Group, the, reintro the Reintroduction Specialist Group, and the Hubara Busted Advisory Group. Yolanda was also a member of the Department of Conservation's Yellow-Eyed Penguin Recovery Group. Professor Van Hesek's urban biodiversity work attracts media interest both in New Zealand and worldwide, in the print media and with numerous appearances on radio and television shows, including the BBC. But now is the time to hear from Yolanda in her own words. So please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Professor Yolanda Van Hesek. Thank you for that introduction. Tēnā koutou. Ko Ōtapoti, te tūraka waiwai, i tuku, ai kei au ki Ōtapoti, i raro, o te maru, o te mauka, ka puka tamahaka, i te taha, o te, maru, o, o te awa, o puki haukia. Kei te noho, au ki o te poti. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. 
I was born in Dunedin, and uh, in fact, I was born exactly one kilometre north of this lecture theatre. And um, although I've spent some parts of my life away from Dunedin, oh, just trying to advance the. Uh, right. Sorry, although I've spent some parts of my life away from Dunedin, I've always come back to Dunedin, and I've always come back to the University of Otago. So, um, as uh, Richard said, I did my undergraduate studies here at the University of Otago. And when I started, I didn't really know what I wanted to, to do. I didn't have a particular career in mind. And I took a variety of, of different courses. Some were focused on plants, some on animals, um, and some on people. But it, um, it, but it rap rapidly became clear to me that animals were by far the most interesting. And so when I was reflecting on my research over the, um, the extent of my career, um, I was quite bemused when I noticed this um, pattern. So over time, this is the proportion of my publications that are focused on either animals or people, um, I seem to be studying animals less and people more. And in fact, the reason for this is that um, I, I'm really interested in urban ecology and applied conservation biology. So um, first I want to describe just briefly some of my more animal-focused research, but then I'd like to spend most of this presentation talking about the research that I've done in the, in the urban environment. So when I, when I graduated here with my honours degree, which um, incidentally was actually on fish physiology, um, I had the opportunity to go to Europe, and this was my, uh, to the Netherlands in fact, and this was my introduction to birds. And um, I ended up at the, the Netherlands Institute for Sea Research, which is on Texel, which is um, the southernmost island uh, here in this string of islands which encloses the Wadden Sea. The Wadden Sea is a big shallow sea and it's a really important area for migratory birds and also for breeding birds. And um, I have to admit that when I first went to um, this lab, I was um, a bit naive about how fanatical some people can be about birds. I hadn't heard about twitches. And, um, and in fact, my supervisor was one of these people. And so a couple of uh, days after I arrived in, in the Netherlands, he took me out to a, a huge mud flat, gave me a pair of binoculars, and asked me to identify all the birds. And I couldn't really identify any of them. <laughs> so I, th I think he thought I was completely useless. Um, but despite that sort of rocky start to our relationship, um, I actually published my first um, uh, study here that was on these two species, sanderlings and dunlins, and that was looking at the uh, influence of chemoreception on their foraging behavior, and there were um, a few other papers that followed that. And uh, my time there really taught me that I, I was really into research, and so uh, after I spent a couple of years there, I was lured back to New Zealand with um, a, uh, a, a wildlife scholarship, so that was one of the last two that were given out by the Wildlife Service before it was um, collapsed and then turned into the Department of Conservation. And it was to study this uh, fairly magnificent bird, the yellow-eyed penguin, or hui ho. Um, so when I started working on, on yellow-eyed penguins, uh, we didn't really know that much about them. There had been quite a long study that was done by a guy called Lance Richdale in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and then John Darby from the museum had started to monitor their populations on the Otago Peninsula. But it was my job to... Um, to do research, just finding out as much as I could about their diet and the growth along their mainland distribution. And um, my supervisors were uh, John Gillett on the right and Lloyd Davis, but as Richard Barker mentioned, um, Lloyd Davis actually took over the supervision. I started off with uh, a supervisor in zoology who was, he was quite old school, and um, the only thing I ever really remember him telling me was that it was a waste of money educating women at tertiary institutions. So, <laughs> so um, I was really glad when Lloyd took over my, uh, my supervisorship. Um, and of course, John Darby played a really important role mentoring me uh, throughout my first year. And I'm really happy to say that a lot of the information that I collected as part of that, part of my PhD, it's still um, useful today. It's kind of used as a reference point um, so I have uh, a PhD student who's in the audience, Mel, 
and she um, has, has also been looking at the diet of yellow-eyed penguins using a lot more sophisticated techniques, so she doesn't have to make them vomit. She looks at the DNA and the feces. And, um, and so by comparing her data with the stuff that I collected 35 years ago, then we can see that there's been a massive shift in um, the diet of yellow-eyed penguins. It's much less diverse than it was 35 years ago, and the main species that they eat is you know, completely shifted. And this is probably contributing to um, the decline in their populations. But after my, um, my PhD, I went to the University of Cape Town. And again, um, the research was focused on penguins. So this is the African penguin. And um, in this case, we were, we were looking at um, reproductive strategies. So you know, how, how these penguins um, raise, uh, uh, I guess, the optimum number of healthy young in the face of um, fluctuating environmental conditions. And that work involved um, fairly lengthy stays on some islands off the southwest coast of South Africa that are just covered in birds. They're fantastic places. And uh, I, I know that there's some uh, yellow-eyed penguin biologists in the audience, so they can understand how thrilled I was. If you can see that picture of me, that there's all these nests just scattered around on the surface. They're so easy to find compared to yellow-eyed penguin nests, which require um, hours of crawling through prickly scrub. Um, so I was pretty thrilled when I got to, um, to see how easy it was uh, in uh, on South Africa. But following that, um, I was with my husband at that point, Phil, and we went to Saudi Arabia, a sort of completely different environment. And in fact, it was Phil that got the job. We both applied for the job, but um, I was politely told that they didn't employ women. And in fact, I actually had to marry Phil to stay with him to go there. <laughs> but it worked out okay in the end, so I have no regrets. <laughs> um, and we were employed by the National Wildlife Research Center. And this, um, they were actually um, carrying out these two quite large captive breeding and reintroduction programs. And one of them was for the Arabian oryx, which is a species that went extinct in the wild in the early 70s. And the other was um, for the hubara bustard, and that's a bird that you can see on the slide there. So hubara bustards are um, found across Central Asia and North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, but they'd been pretty much extirpated off the Arabian Peninsula because they were a very popular quarry uh, for falcon, falconry, and falconry is a, a really popular sport in the Middle East. And so there was this one relic population in the far north, and um, it was our job to find out as much information as we could um, about the ecology of this population so that it would inform the, um, the, re the reintroduction program. And so we spent a lot of time, this is our study site, it's, uh, it is a fantastic area. It looks a bit like Mars, but it's more interesting, I think. Um, it's uh, in a, a huge protected area called Harat al Hara, which is um, just located in the far north, so it's just under the border with Iraq and Jordan. And it's a basalt lava desert. And this is where, uh, well, it's about 12,500 kilometers, which is about the same size as Fiordland. And uh, there was a very small population of these Hubara bustards roaming around there. And the um, the uh, protected area was policed by um, about, there were four groups of rangers that were living in different parts of the reserve. And um, the guy on the left is the chief ranger, um, Ali al Mari, and he was um, just an amazing tracker and navigator and um, also a really charming man as well. And as well as um, that, we discovered when we were there that at the time anyway, there was just very little interest in the natural history of um, species in Saudi Arabia, so there were heaps of opportunities for us to travel around and collect information from a whole range of species and, and a whole range of biomes as well. And when I, I was back at the center, then I was also carrying out research looking at the actual captive breeding, so the rearing protocols around uh, rearing chicks and just looking at ways to improve them so that um, the chicks that were produced were, um, were um, healthy ones and would have the the best chance of survival once they were reintroduced into the wild. So at that point in time, all of my publications were on animals and there were none on people at all. But after nearly 10 years in Saudi Arabia, we came back to Dunedin. And uh, we, um, so these slides are actually changing on their own. I have no control over this, so I hope that I can keep up with them. Not quite sure why they're doing that. Uh, but um, 
so we came back to the, the position that we had at, at um, the University of Otago um, in the wildlife management program. And um, I found that the research I'd been doing in Saudi Arabia just didn't translate very well uh, to uh, New Zealand. And so that's when I reinvented myself as an urban ecologist. And at that time, urban ecology was quite a young sub-discipline, of course, of ecology, but um, traditionally modified landscapes like um, urban areas hadn't really been valued very much, so the, um, all of the focus was on more pristine landscapes um, or the conservation estate. Um, but it, over the 20 years or so, that attitude has changed now. And uh, for example, in 2017 was when we were successful in getting our first MB Endeavour grant, and that was, um, well, it's called, well, our program was called People, Cities and Nature, and it was completely focused on biodiversity and restoration in urban areas. And then last year we were successful with um, another grant um, <coughs> to follow on from that. So for ecologists, um, urban areas are really interesting for a start. Um, there's a lot of people in them. And um, back in 2018, that marked the point at which more than 50% of the world's population were now living in urban areas. So that's, those are the places where all of the population growth is happening as well. And on this graph, you can see the difference. These are the proportions of, um, for different reg regions of uh, human populations that live in the cities uh, between 1950, which are the purple bars, and um, 2020, which are the green bars. But in really developed countries like New Zealand, then um, that proportion is somewhere around 86%. So for most people, um, their, their first experience of nature and many of their daily uh, interactions with nature are going to be happening in an urban environment. And for some people, it's that, that's it. They don't go out to national parks or other places. Uh, it's all happening in urban areas. Right, <laughs> it changed again. So, um, so, so the urban areas, so, the, so there is significant biodiversity that can be found in um, urban areas. Like it, it is a significant contribution to the regional biodiversity. And biodiversity plays a lot of roles um, in ecosystem processes, and it uh, contributes to the generation of ecosystem services. And these can be categorized into these four groups here. So you've got um, provisioning services, which are things like uh, the production of food or um, materials or medicinal resources. You've got regulating services, uh, which are things um, to do with uh, the regulation of water or air quality. Um, you've got supporting services, which include things like nutrient cycling and photosynthesis. And then you've got these cultural services, which are actually become very important in urban areas because they, of course, a lot of people live there. And, and that's the, um, the services that are concerned with, um, I guess, spiritual and uh, aesthetic values that are associated with nature, um, also recreation and ecotourism. But there's been quite a lot of emphasis on this mental and um, physical health. And uh, for example, um, this is a graphical abstract from a study that was just published last year. It was um, an umbrella review, so it was reviewing um, 40 systematic reviews, um, that most of which have been published since 2019, on the link between exposure to greenness and, um, and various uh, measures of health, both physical and psychological, and they found evidence for positive links with um, all of the things that are, that are listed there. And there's, there's been particular uh, interest in, in um, psychological health. And so another study that was just published this month, which was one of these, another one of these big reviews, actually identified that there was, um, there was a, a, a convincing body of evidence that shows that um, people that live in greener areas are less likely to um, suffer from psychopathologies such as um, in children it might be ADHD or in adults it might be depression. Um, and, but also the symptoms are less. So there's, so there's quite a lot of evidence that being in green areas is good for you, but most of these studies in fact are done by public health uh, people. They're not really done by ecologists and they don't seem to collaborate with ecologists very often. And so what we don't know is what, what sort of elements it is of the green that is actually um, providing those well-being benefits. Um, but some ecologists, there is some work now that suggests that biodiversity does play an important role so that um, there are more well-being benefits often associated with people that are in more biodiverse environments than, ones, than people who are in less biodiverse environments. And so that, that kind of information is just um, 
uh, it's resulted in this sort of plethora of nature-based therapies. If you have a look on the internet, there's heap, heaps of um, books and different courses and all sorts of things. So, um, so cities, as I mentioned, they can make significant contributions to regional biodiversity. I mean, of course, they're highly modified landscapes, so natural habitats have been, um, have been built over and there's um, a whole lot of human-related infrastructure like roads. Um, but still, in some places, say in, in, in Europe, it's been shown that uh, some species actually find refuges in cities. They are declining in, say, production landscapes that surround the cities, but they're doing okay in the cities themselves. And urbanization acts as a massive filter, though, for species. So essentially, as, um, if you look at this, this is the relationship between uh, abundance of species and human population density that you get these three main groups. So one group are the urban avoiders, these are these ones here, and those are the species that are just completely intolerant of, of any or all of the, of the, um, the conditions that come with um, human population density. And then you've got um, the urban adapters, so they are okay up to a certain point, but when the human um, population gets at a certain density, then they start, start to drop out. And then you've got a group of species which are the urban exploiters, and they're the ones that are actually benefiting from people. You know, they're using structures that are built by people or they're eating food which is provided by people. Um, but even those, if once the human population density gets to a certain point, they can also disappear too. And a good example of that is, um, is the house sparrow, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, so in some cities in the UK and in Europe, in, in some parts of those cities, house spar sparrows have actually disappeared. And uh, the general feeling is that there's just not enough vegetation volume in those parts of the cities to support the invertebrates that house sparrows need to be feeding their young. So I'd like to, um, before I start talking my own research, I want to talk about these three different paradigms um, of urban ecology. So as I mentioned, urban ecology is quite a young discipline. and um, but over, over time, it's kind of evolved through these different ways of thinking. And so the first is uh, referred to as ecology in the city. And, and this is where, um, I guess, ecologists take their skill set and they apply them to familiar habitats which, um, which are actually embedded in, a, in an urban landscape. So they, it might be fragments of bush or the town belt or cemeteries or something like that. Um, but then in ecology of the city, the focus moves away from those biotic features and it adopts more of a holistic sociological approach. So it's recognizing that it's um, socially derived processes that are actually driving a lot of the, the, um, the things that are happening with different species in, um, in cities and towns. And this, this paradigm actually requires collaboration um, with other scientists like social scientists, but you know, maybe with economists or with urban planners or geographers. And, um, and this paradigm is, has sort of emerged more recently, I guess, and um, it's really come about um, in response to, uh, I guess, social goals for urban sustainability. And so it's kind of a unifying paradigm because it takes the information that you get from the other two paradigms and then it, it, it addresses issues around um, human well-being and urban livability. And so this paradigm really requires um, collaboration or, or engagement with the decision makers. So not just urban residents, but, um, but uh, policy makers and uh, you know, I guess professional practitioners as well. So th I think that my research has really um, reflected that journey uh, and it's sort of inadvertently. So first of all, I would like to talk about some of the stuff that I've done which falls into that paradigm of ecology in the city. And I started out by just, uh, was interested in birds, distributions of birds and the, the different um, factors that drive their distributions. And so we did lots of bird counts right across the whole city and we measured a lot of the, uh, of the different features of the vegetation and modeled which uh, of those features were the most important. And if, just going back to that um, figure I showed you before, um, these uh, are examples of urban avoiders here in Dunedin, so those are robins and tomtits, and they're sit sitting just on the edge of the city, but they don't come in, or if they do come in, perhaps they just get eaten really quickly. So um, you don't really see them in, in the city. And then 
Um, at the other extreme, you've got the urban exploiters, like the house sparrows and, and starlings. And then among the urban adapters, you've got um, these native species, so tui, bellbird, and kiruru. And, but the, where you find these birds is really dependent on um, characteristics of, of the vegetation. So we found when we, we modelled which ones were the most important that it's um, vegetation volume, um, it's the proportion of native species in the vegetation, and also features like whether there are any tall trees. And so, th so the actual numbers can vary hugely across the urban gradient. So this um, figure here just shows the proportion of the total counted. So the dark green bars are those birds like tui and bellbird, which I've called forest natives. The, the yellow bits are other natives, so they tend to be gulls and, um, say, paradise ducks. But you can see that from the peri-urban here, where they make up um, the, the largest proportion of the count, and peri-urban areas would be places like Ross Creek, um, that's where they're most abundant. They're also quite abundant in the town belt, but they're more abundant in the parts of the town belt that are dominated by native vegetation. And then as you go through into residential areas, quite different depending on where you are. So that residential three uh, properties that have um, quite large gardens that are quite well vegetated. Residential two, um, the gardens are quite big but they're not so well vegetated. And residential three are quite small areas with, with, uh, with poor vegetation. So essentially if you live in a street like this, then you've got, and you went outside, you'd probably about see, well sorry, probably about uh, somewhere between a quarter and a third of all the birds that you'd see would be those forest natives. Um, and that's about as good as it gets in New Zealand, actually. It's quite sad, but <laughs> it's quite poor compared to other countries, but um, that's about as good as it gets. But if you lived out in the flat in um, South Dunedin or St Kilda, then less than 10% of the birds that you see will actually be those, those native species. And most of them, in fact, will be silver eyes. Gosh, this um, slideshow is really hurrying me along, so <laughs> I hope that I can keep up. Um, so another study that I was involved in with, um, with Ian McLean was nest survival. And so we were interested in these three common species, blackbird and fantails and silver eyes. And those, pr those percentages represent the proportion of nests which produced at least one young. And um, that was over two years, that's why there are two figures. So we were able to determine the cause of, of um, nest loss for about half of those, and the biggest cause is, is predation. Uh, I think it was something like 29%. Um, and I guess it was that observation that started me um, thinking about pr urban predators. And so I've done a number of studies involved, uh, that involve predators, and the first one was domestic cats. And um, the domestic cat study was kind of uh, a citizen science project. I had about 100 um, cat owners across the city who were recording all the th dead things that their cat brought back over the course of a year. And uh, we also tracked the cats using GPS collars. And um, the owners were always uh, invariably surprised at how far their cats went, <laughs> but always very interested to learn. Um, I had a PhD student, Amy Adams, and she was also tracking possums. and. The information that she found uh, was that possums can actually exist quite independently of bush fragments. They can be just living across gardens as long as there's enough um, vegetation in the gardens. And this kind of information is really important for informing um, eradication strategies across uh, Dunedin for possums. And more recently, Charlotte Patterson was modelling reinvasion of possums across the urban landscape. And Andrew McCulloch was another master's student. And he looked at the density of rats and was able to show that, um, that in fact, Dunedin's not a very ratty city, not compared with, um, say, Wellington. And um, that was confirmed more recently with some work that we did as part of the People, Cities and Nature program uh, with, with Deb Wilson from Landcare Research, um, where we, we um, essentially looked at distributions of the whole suite of um, invasive mammals across the city and other cities. But I think it was, it was this particular study that got me start, started, that started to get me thinking about gardens. Um, it was on a common, the common or grass skink. And this is an incredibly common skink. It's, it's amazingly tolerant to habitat modification, and it should be everywhere, but it isn't. Um, it just exists in these small pockets across uh, the urban area, and it's probably because it gets eaten by um, cats and hedgehogs and, and, I guess, rats and mice as well. 
Um, but when we, again, when we modelled the different features of the, of the gardens where skinks could be found, then it was um, one of the, the main features that was important was the messiness of the garden. And of course, the messiness of the garden is determined by you know, the attitude and the values of the, of the householder. So that really started me thinking about how, um, how people were obviously, well, well, were playing a role clearly in determining what kind of biodiversity we had and where it was distributed. So at this point, yeah, people were starting to, um, to figure in some of my publications. And I think that from, from then, most of my research really sort of moved into this paradigm of ecology of the city. So that's um, more of a, of a sociological approach to thinking about processes. And, um, and of course, this involved uh, collaboration, so things started to get more fun. And the first uh, thing that I, study I'd like to talk about is a Dedean Garden study, and this was a collaboration with Claire Freeman from Geography, um, Kath Dickinson, who's a plant ecologist, and Barbara Barrett, who's an entomologist at Ag Research. And at that time, um, no one had really done any studies on garden biodiversity in New Zealand. Um, and so we were interested in documenting what kind of biodiversity gardens support. But, uh, but we were also interested in the householders and uh, their values and their relationships with their gardens. And um, so we collected a lot of information and, that we could use to actually show what was driving that garden biodiversity. And in fact, um, there was some of the social variables were uh, equally as important as the, um, as the more physical variables. And so, you know, gardens are <coughs> potentially places that can support a lot of biodiversity. Um, oh, these, two <laughs> these two images are um, both from Dunedin, so the properties are about the same size, but you can see that the ones up on the top left are much more biodiverse, they just have a lot more um, vegetation volume than the ones uh, down on the, on the right. And um, so I'm going to return to gardens uh, after a while, but um, another study that I'd like to talk about, which is based on my cat work, which is completely different, but it involved another kind of um, collaboration that I found uh, really interesting. And, so, and, and that was based on cats. So at this point in time, I had done my cat studies. Some of my students had done more cat studies. We had got lots of information about what cats kill, and we modeled impacts on prey populations, and we tracked them. So we had a pretty good idea what domestic cats do. Um, so I'd reached the point where I didn't want to collect more information like that. I wanted to figure out how to actually mitigate the impacts of domestic cats on urban wildlife. And that, that means changing cat owners' behavior. So again, it comes back to having to manage people. And so there were a, this particular study was actually a collaboration with an environmental psychologist, um, Edie McDonald. She was working at that time as a social scientist in the Department of Conservation. And she was, um, she, her spe speciality was really um, coming up with uh, con conservation messages that are effective. So conservation biologists are actually really bad at conservation messaging. They don't get taught about that generally when it's really a, like a psychologist thing. And um, so it was good to see how Edie kind of managed that process. So um, the first thing that we had to come up with, and we did that through a series of surveying cat owners across uh, New Zealand and different vet clinics, was the behavior that we were gonna focus on, and we chose this all cats should be brought in at nighttime behavior which I actually disagree with because it's not really relevant to New Zealand, but my co-workers persuaded me that it was a good first step. Um, I had previously done some research as part of an um, international collaboration, and we'd asked um, cat owners and not cat owners, like the dark blue are cat owners and these are the non-cat owners, and a, um, a range of countries whether they agreed with that statement. So you can see that in New Zealand, although the agreement isn't as high as in, say, Australia, um, or the US or Japan, that there still is a proportion of people who agreed with that statement, the cat owners. So we thought it was a good place to start. And um, so when Edie is doing this work, she, uh, she applies this theory from psychology called the theory of planned behavior. And that's used as a framework that drives the whole research process. And so the theory of be planned behavior um, essentially asserts that there are these three components that influence people's intentions to perform a behavior. So one is the, um, their attitude towards that behavior, 
there, then there are the subjective norms, and those are really determined by the beliefs that people have about important other people as to whether they think that they should do the behaviour. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, and then perceived behavioural control is uh, really your um, the way that you think about whether you can actually feasibly carry out a behaviour. And so we embarked on this, um, I don't want to show you that yet, oops. We, we embarked on um, a whole lot of surveys of cat owners at all these uh, cat uh, um, vet clinics across New Zealand and to collect information about each of those components that would inform a social marketing campaign. And um, so in terms of, on the bottom left, in terms of um, strong normative influences, then we found that veterinarians and uh, family members would, would, were those, but not the SPCA, Department of Conservation, Forest and Bird, or Gareth Morgan. Um, in terms of the perceived, perceived behavioural control, we found that it just wasn't an issue with cat owners. They were quite happy to have a cat flap or a, a litter box. And then in terms of attitudes towards that behaviour that were most likely to re result in this um, intention to do something, um, what was really disappointing for me was that people just don't care about the impact on native wildlife. So there was no point designing um, a campaign around that sort of message. I mean, people cared about the safety of their cats, you know, whether they were going to be hit by cars, um, and they cared, of course, whether their cat liked being inside. Um, so on the basis of that information, then we came up with these two messages. So each of them was, were using um, one of those normative, um, one of those normative influences, so in this case it's a vet, and it's got a message about cat safety. Um, and in this case, it was a little girl, so it was like a family member, and she had a message about um, how it was nice to bring your cat in at night. And I've probably uh, given <laughs> away what happens next, but um, one of those, when we trialled those in different vet clinics across the country, one of those messages turned out to be much more effective than the other, more significantly effective. So which one do you think it was? Was it the vet and the safety? <laughs> You've already seen it. It's a little girl. No, it was her. And um, I just would never have picked that. Like as a biologist, I would never have thought that this was the case. So for me, it really brought home um, just the value of these collaborations that make you um, to think to, to do things in a different way and make you, I guess, realise your your own um, lack of <laughs> skill in certain area. And that's where collaborations, of course, are fantastic because you can pull in skills from other people. So at this point, yeah, the trajectories were starting to, um, to come together. So for the, for the rest, I'd like to talk about some studies that I've done that I think fit into this paradigm. So that was ecology for the city. So that so those are studies that are really um, investigating relationships between nature and human well-being and, um, and urban livability. And um, I'd like to start off with uh, this study, which was children's access to nature. So back in um, 2008, uh, this guy Richard Louvre wrote a book called The Last Child in the Woods, and he followed that up with another one called The Nature Principle. And in his first book, he um, defined, he coined a term, it was nature deficit disorder. And he said that urban children in the US anyway way were suffering from nature deficit disorder. They didn't have enough contact with nature. And as a result of that, they were suffering these um, kind of physical and psychological problems like obesity or ADHD. And his book was actually really influential in that a lot of schools um, started up programs where they would bus their kids out to, to natural areas. So, um, so Claire Freeman and I uh, were interested in how children in New Zealand cities connect with nature. And when we, we started this study, it was um, based on um, children aged between about 9 and 11, and we were interested in their independent movement, so their movements where they weren't accompanied by an adult, but they could be accompanied by their peers. Um, we surveyed children over three cities, so Auckland, Wellington, and Dunedin. And we asked, uh, what was the availability of bi bi uh, neighbourhood biodiversity for these children, and did they actually use those areas that were biodiverse? So we actually had to come up with a whole scheme for kind of measuring the... Um, biodiversity value of all these small urban habitats. 
So the children um, had an a interactive GIS map and they mapped where they went with it, from, um, their houses somewhere in here, and then we calculated their home range as um, that's the yellow polygon. We just used a technique which um, is commonly used when you're um, calculating home ranges for animals actually. Um, but, but it was easy with children because they could tell us where they went. Usually with animals you have to follow them around for ages um, getting locations, so it was great. So that home range was quite small, but this one here was a lot bigger. It included a park and uh, some playing fields. And then we had to define the neighborhood, um, and on the basis of all of our, uh, we had about 180 kids, the maximum distance on average that they moved away from their home was about just short of 500 meters. So we created a sort of a buffer that had a radius of 500 meters, um, and we called that their neighborhood. Um, but then the children also told us where they weren't allowed to go, so there were some places where their parents might have told them they couldn't go, or maybe there might have been a busy road, so we kind of chopped those bits out of the neighborhood. And, um, and then we calculated their home range, which is, the, um, of course, the polygon that you see there. Um, and so what we found was that in those neighborhoods, that there was a, um, all the children had access to um, at least one green space. But when you looked at those um, neighborhoods that had had the bits where they weren't allowed to cut out, then that number dropped to two thirds. Um, and then when you actually saw, uh, looked at their home range size, um, it was only 35%. And um, the limitations that are placed on kids, are, are they're just usually parental restraints, um, but also kids, we found that they were just really busy. You know, They just had so many after school activities and things on that they just didn't seem to have time just to go away and muck around and, and roam around. Um, and this, the home range sizes were actually, I think on average, only about six hectares, it's quite small. Um, and this reduction in home range size in children has been measured in a number of countries, so it's not just unique to New Zealand. But I was curious and I did a rough calculation of my own home range, um, my independent one at, at, when I was about that age, and it was more like 150 hectares. And I don't think that I was particularly unusual either. So um, children really are moving around much less than they, um, than they used to just uh, another generation ago. And the other thing we, that we found was that children weren't using the most biodiverse habitats. You know, often when they went out, they might just go to a playing field. Um, but despite that, because we, we asked them questions about animals and uh, relationships to habitats, that they did have quite a good understanding and so we thought that um, the reason why they did was really because of the diversity that they had in their own gardens. And this is a, quite a nice example of that. So this property, uh, there was a little girl living there, so she was not allowed to go out of her property without an adult with her. Um, but she still had quite a good understanding of animals and, um, and their habitats. And, and so we think that it's because she had quite a biodiverse garden. And so we suspect that, you know, kids are, um, when they're not allowed to roam very far or they're unwilling to, they're spending most of their time in their gardens. And so their gardens actually assume a really important role for them in terms of um, connecting them with, with nature. So I guess children are a group that have um, limited mobility, and, but that got us interested in another group that has limited mobility, and that is um, older adults. And um, so there are a lot of evidence that there are health benefits for um, older adults, both physical and um, psychological. And so um, Claire and I embarked on another study, and this time it was with Deborah Waters, who's um, a gerontologist, and we looked at how aging affected older adults' ability to engage with nature. And we were interested in different um, domestic spaces, so we surveyed uh, a whole bunch of older adults. Some of them were living in their, um, in their uh, family homes. Some of them had downsized, say, to a, like a, re um, a retirement village or something like that. Some were living in council flats, and some were living in rest homes. And yeah, we collected quite a lot of information about how they felt about the limitations, but and when we modelled um, the factors that actually influenced how much time they spent in natural places, then as you would expect, as um, with increasing age and frailty, then that reduces um, housing type was significant because people in rest homes really didn't get out very much. 
And this, the Nature Connection score, which is a score that reflects your relationship with nature, was actually a positive factor and that people that had a higher nature connection score were more likely to overcome those barriers imposed by age and frailty and to actually get out. But then when we looked at the time spent in the garden, then none of these were significant. The only thing was their nature connection score. And that told us that, you know, regardless of how old they were, and we had people in our study that were in their 90s, um, and regardless of how frail, that, um, that people were still able to go out and spend time in their gardens, they became very important places for them. So, um, so they needed a, a nearby green space, and, um, and it was, that was essentially that role was filled by the garden. So gardens are biodiverse sites, potentially, um, and places where people can connect with nature, but they also are nowadays very much um, threatened spaces. So, so in this image you can see an older suburb on the left and a newer suburb which is um, characteristic of, of median density housing on the right. And um, yeah, there's a huge difference in the amount of green area across those two. And as well as that, um, there are trends like uh, increases in hard landscaping. So when we visited all of the 55 gardens that we um, examined for our garden study, we went back to them after five years and we measured the differences in the garden, and we found across them all there was about a 2% increase in hard landscaping, so, or, or things being built over. And that might not seem very much, 2%, but if you extrapolate that across all the gardens in Dunedin, that's something like 19 hectares of land that had been paved over. So there are various um, processes going on, uh, not just increases in hard landscaping, but um, looser regulations around infill development and you know rezoning like uh, was in the newspaper today so a whole lot of properties in, um, in uh, Dunedin now can be sort of subdivided and uh, are more open to medium density housing um, and because of that I guess in our cities we have this proportion of um, properties that have big gardens um, the traditional gardens but they're diminishing all the time because of those those different um, factors like um, hard landscaping and you know, people just extending their patios or whatever. Um, but you also have an increasing proportion of modern um, residential developments where um, the gardens are just tiny. I mean, I made a submission to the council about their rezoning and they, um, uh, they made a provision in response to my submission, which means that in these new developments, um, uh, at least 20% of the property has to be landscaped, but 20% is hardly anything. <laughs> so it's really important that we, um, if we want to keep having green cities and stop the loss of biodiversity, that we have to really make the best of what we've got, but we also have to be better at creating spaces and new developments. And an idea that um, we, I had just a couple of years ago was to actually create a garden certification scheme, which is I've called Garden Star. And this came about um, at a conference in 2020 called Urban Futures in Auckland. Um, I was the only person up there that was talking about biodiversity. Uh, and I had an interesting conversation with someone from Kainga Ora, which of course is the um, organization which is tasked with building 40,000 state homes over the next few years. And she was just really concerned that there were absolutely no guidelines or standards associated with how they would treat the green spaces around their houses. And so over a glass of wine, we came up with this idea of this Garden Star certification, because there's such a thing as a home star, and that's a certification that reflects your, the sustainability of your house, but we thought we should have one that reflects the, the native biodiversity value of your garden. And um, we hoped that it would kind of acknowledge uh, people who actually had good gardens, but incentivize other people to improve their gardens and uh, maybe um, set standards or track changes over time. And so I got together a whole bunch, but, but, but sorry, before I go on, um, yeah, it requires a rating tool. So essentially, if you have a certification program, someone has to go out to a garden, spend one or two hours there, have a chat with the householder, and then come away um, with information that can be condensed into one number or a number of stars that reflects the biodiversity of that garden. And so that's what um, I've been involved with for a couple of years with this huge group of people across uh, New Zealand. They're all experts. They're horticulturalists and plant ecologists and um, 
animal ecologist, and uh, we've come up with this way of, of doing this, which we think is a robust way of measuring biodiversity. And so now I guess we, we're just um, in the process of trying to promote the whole scheme. So um, I just wanted to talk briefly about the fact that we haven't just focused on private green spaces, but also on public green space. And um, as part of the first People, Cities and Nature program, uh, PhD student Audrey Hazer, Hazer's work was really focused on um, what kind of green spaces people use, what are the uh, features about those green spaces they like, um, what are their landscape preferences, and uh, to basically condense a whole lot of stuff into one very short conclusion, people just really like biodiverse areas. As long as those areas contain the features that they need to do what they want to do, which could be as simple as a path or a seat or somewhere to socialize, then people will always, will, will nearly always, regardless of their ethnicity, choose that left option over the right. And the left option is more diverse. It has more understory and it has more species diversity. So I feel that there's no excuse for having spaces like this in cities. I mean, this isn't a playing field. It's just a big area of grass that has to be mown all the time. And, in, oh, and instead of streets that look like this, then you know, why can't we have um, streets that look like this? So right, so I've reached a point where nearly half of my publications are about people. But that doesn't mean that I think that people are more interesting than animals. <laughs> Because I guess while my research has really been um, looking at that relationship between people and nature and implications for well-being, um, it's always motivated by a desire to see more biodiversity in urban areas. So you know, how can we take that evidence um, of the uh, of the benefits that people derive from nature connection and leverage it into really good conservation outcomes? So that's where I'm heading. So just to finish off with, I just wanted to mention the project that I'm involved with now. It's the, um, <clears throat> the uh, more recent People, Cities and Nature iteration. It just really started this year. So there's a number of teams, but my particular team is, is focused on how to actually inject more biodiversity into these medium density built environments. And um, of course, they, they're just becoming more and more common in New Zealand, um, but we feel that they could be done much better. And so we've started off by, um, at the moment, we're just reviewing best practice both in New Zealand but also overseas. And then we want to engage with all those decision makers again. So the developers, um, the, uh, the architects, the landscape architects, the planners, but also the residents that actually, of people who actually live in these areas. And we want to be able to identify um, design strategies and policy related strategies that will improve practice and um, result in a much more um, sensitive biodiversity design. Right, well, my talk is hurrying me into the acknowledgements. So <laughs> I just, uh, this is my wildlife management class from this year um, on one of our field trips. This is on the Tasman Delta. Um, I think, as any academic knows, one of the, the great pleasures of the job is the fact that you're constantly surrounded by all these really um, interesting and smart and enthusiastic students and colleagues. And uh, I have very much appreciated all of my interactions with my students and all my, uh, my colleagues over the years and would like to thank them for the contribution they've made to you know, making my job so, so pleasant. But um, I'd also want to uh, acknowledge all of the members of the public who've participated in our research our surveys can often be quite long, but they've been uh, really generous in their time. So this is my, my parents. Um, neither of them had the opportunity to study at a university, but they were always uh, supportive of my studies. Um, I think at times they must have wondered how gallivanting around after penguins could possibly um, ever turn into a proper job. But um, if they did, they kept it to themselves and um, they seem to have a lot of faith in the decisions that I was making, so I really appreciate that. And that's my mum and her garden. Um, she actually uh, worked in that garden until she was 93. It was 53 years. It was a very big, productive garden, and, um, and I think it meant a lot to her. I think she, uh, she really, she told me once that she communed with God in her garden. Uh, but 
but I probably should um, acknowledge my husband. <laughs> so, Phil uh, said, um, our journey has truly been a shared one. So we, we first of all shared a, a study species, the yellow-eyed penguins, then we shared an office, um, and then after that we, uh, we shared a postdoc in Cape Town, whoops, this was the Cape Town, and, uh, and following that of course we ended up working together in um, Saudi Arabia. And, and when we left that job, then we came back and we, we had a shared position here at the University of Otago, which has expanded um, out so that we, we're, uh, we're both working more than one position now. But um, I, I don't know how I could have done everything that I did without Phil, so <laughs> thank you, Phil. And uh, these are my two wonderful sons, Connor and Jasper, and I wanted to thank them. They've been dragged along on so many field trips over the years and they've been exposed to an awful lot of shop talk over meals, but they have taken it all with great grace and good humour. So thank you, you two. And uh, thank you all very much for coming this evening. Kia ora. Mask of Hidden Eye. Tena Kauta Katoa. Ki Professor Nicholson, Ki Professor Barker, Ki Professor Blakey. Tena Kauta. Professor Van Hazek, Mo Tefano. Tena Kauta. Ki Te Manu Hiri. Tena Kauta. Kote um, Ko Mark Lockman Takuingoa. Kote Tumuaku Ahau, Te Tari Matai Kararehe. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Greetings to you all, especially of course to you, Yolanda, but uh, also the audience and uh, of course um, Yolanda's family. It's uh, really wonderful to see you all here. My name is Mark Lockman, I'm the Head of Department in Zoology and it's really my, my honour and my pleasure to be able to reflect on not only your presentation here today, but, but actually your walk um, your professional walk and your time in the department over the last 20 or so years. I guess as colleagues, what connects us is, is animals, and I'll come back to that uh, a little bit more shortly. Um, I, I guess there is also a little bit of a heritage connect that in your case um, is evident in your name and in my case uh, is evident from my accent. Um, and I should probably have worn a, uh, an, an orange shirt, um, <laughs> but, but I'll leave that for another occasion. Never mind the uh, heritage, um, it's, it's really much more relevant to do today to talk about uh, animals and of course the IPL that we've just heard about. Um, Professor von Hezek has taken us through her life's journey. We've heard her early focus on the ecology of birds and as time went she has changed that and as yourself uh, you indicated you innovated urban ecology as a field that you um, are really increasingly passionate about and um, have extensively published in. She has highlighted that biodiversity contributes to important ecosystem services, not only in natural settings, but also in urban environments. We've heard in that story um, about avian communities that we might find in our backyards, and the notion that some species adapt to modified habitats and some don't. With time, the impacts of humans on the environment and their interactions have increasingly found a place in Yolanda's research. These focal points are of immediate societal interest and it attests to Yolanda's commitment to um, both human well-being and animal wildlife that she has been notably present in that space. A space that intersects both fields and a presence that has helped to bridge the gap between the general public and our immediate environment. Indeed, 
Yolanda's strong societal interest is a thread in her research. She recently started a project with her colleagues elsewhere on, ca uh, on campus that seeks to establish the well-being benefits of virtual reality videos of nature. And as one of the um, subjects in that, uh, in that study, um, I followed that space with notable interest. While we may feel comfortable about the link between well-being and nature, some contentious issues have also arisen as part of Yolanda's research, and she's hinted at some of that. Um, we have heard the word cats come up, and the idea that cats might be doing stuff that the owners rather didn't know about. Well, in publicizing this in local media outlets, um, some of the cat-loving folks have not necessarily responded with, um, yes, we're all in favor of what you're saying, um, rather, Phyllis told me that Yolanda has me received plenty of message that was written in caps only <laughs> and with lots of excl exclamation marks. Um, and, and I think we could probably imagine what these messages may have said. But you marched on. I feel compelled, and you also hinted at that in your IPL, um, and um, Professor Barker also mentioned that. Um, the issue around women in science, especially about women in science and being a mum, and obviously that pertains to you, not to me, um, but there is this issue about being a mum and pursuing an academic career, and the conflict between time for these priorities um, is really a difficult one to manage. Um, I really extend my full admiration to Yolanda for having managed to fill both these tasks or these priorities so excellently. I, I do think um, that it is probably still easier for men than it is for women to have this, um, this dual role, these dual priorities, and so um, it's absolutely fantastic how you have succeeded. I started my role as head of department at the start of this year, and one of the delights that comes with that job, believe some, and I can see some people grizzle and kind of go, delights head of department? Surely not. But no, there are some delights that come with that job. And one of those is that one gets to find out much more about the workings of the department, and especially about the workings of one's colleagues. So I think it's fair enough to say that with the different disciplines where you do the big stuff, the important stuff, and I look at little parts within an animal, we don't have much overlap in the research that we do. But being in that head of department role has given me a real privilege and insight about the fantastic contributions that Yolanda has made to our department. It's already mentioned she has been representing zoology on the Animal Ethics Committee. And this is a big, a really big um, service job. In that role, she hasn't just kind of gone to the meetings, um, but certainly on a number of occasions, I've expressed my frustrations. You've listened to me, you've provided advice, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. So thank you. You've also taken on the role as Director of Wildlife Management last year, and of course the administration and the people management that comes with that role. Recognition for the quality of your work is evident not only from a long list of research publications, but also from the research funding that you have attracted. In closing, Professor Van Hasek's commitment to well-being are reflected not only in her research and service roles, but also in her teaching, and we've again heard about that before. And now is a great time to reiterate that input and to say thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution to shaping and teaching and developing the next generation of conservation biologists. I would like to finish with a whakatauki. Whaia te mātauranga hei, oranga mokoto. Seek knowledge for the sake of your well-being. And this whakatauki seems something that can be readily applied to the natural world, world and the role that urban wildlife plays in this. So, kia ora, Yolanda, for your wonderful um, korero and for your contributions to the department for over 20 years. This is the moment where I duck, duck under the table. 
And um, I would like to say on behalf of the department, but especially the university at large, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.